Hey, man. Hey, buddy. How you doing? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Good to see you. Good to see you. You look, you look sharp, like you just got a haircut or something. Are you kidding me? I need a haircut. That's hysterical. But but sure, okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess you're used to seeing it like this. So this is yeah. Like, I'm, I'm used to the the kind of pompadour thing you got going I, on. I cut oh. it so well. I cut it so short for the pilot. We were just shooting. Mm. That I, I haven't had it that short since kindergarten, honestly. So so this yeah. is like a month later, and it hasn't completely, you know. Gotcha. Well, maybe maybe it's just the camera angle looking nice and nice and tapered, cleaned up around the ears there. Yeah, you're looking good. You know, you know. Looking good. So uh, so so fill me in. You're just coming off of a, a meeting for Lenny, yeah? Getting that thing back up and running. Yeah, you know, trying to um, <clears throat> trying to get it. You know, it's been 18 months since I since I've done this 90 minute monologue, and so hmm. I'm trying to remember the words, you know. So I, uh, the I last say just the just the technical requirement is like the biggest burden, probably. The last couple of days, I've been running through it, and a week ago, I had so many brownouts. I was like, "What the hell's going on?" And then, as of the last two days, I felt like, "Okay, okay, it's 80 percent." I I can do the show tonight if I had to, mm -hmm. but it it really takes a certain amount of like stamina and yeah, breath yeah. work. And it's 90 minutes of just this one man show. And so <clears throat> it's really interesting to think that I've been sitting, you know, for a year and a half without, you know, you have to be spiritually, emotionally, physically all in your best shape to do the show. And I'm in none of those. Zero. <laughs> so like, so like, you know, here comes like, you know, maybe some journaling, getting right with myself. Then there's the bike riding. And then there's the, you know, oh. it's, all, it's all like part of like, it's like boot camp for Lenny almost in a sense, you know, it's like, sure. If, you, if you're not there, I'll give you an example. Two weeks ago, I started running the show and I was having all these little mini panic attacks through the whole run going to, Oh my God, do I know the words? Am I in, am I in good enough shape? How's my breathing? It's like, it's a big, it's a big undertaking. And when I was in the middle of it, you know, before the pandemic, I was just, I was just doing it. But, uh, you know, my couch hasn't been helpful in that way. You, know? <laughs> you got a really comfy couch. Oh, I got a comfy couch. And not, you know me, not that yeah, I- You got to replace it with just like a wooden, a wooden cutout and you'll, you'll suddenly whip yourself into shape. Not that I lay around. I'm not that guy, but yeah. it's a different muscle for sure, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. Anyway, that's what's been going on. Yeah, and you, and you actually go, remind me, you go back up with it when? I go back up September 23rd in Los Angeles. I'm doing September. seven performances. And then uh, two performances on October 8th and 9th in New Jersey at the Vogel, which is uh, connected with the Count Basie Theater in Red Bank. And then I'm still working out my details to go back to Chicago. And then I'm in West Palm in February. So I'm starting to starting to set a tour. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I remember uh, last time we were in New York together, I think we chatted and you were telling me, yeah, things were on the on the verge of, yeah, going kind of, yeah, going more of a, uh, of a tour rather than kind of where you had at the time. Well, we booked, we had booked Tampa and some other cities were really on the horizon. And then the pandemic hit, like everybody else. So, you know, had that not happened, of course, anyone can say that. I think we would have, you know, hopefully had many cities booked. Mm -hmm. But since, uh, since that did happen, we're starting over and we're building this, this tour what's good my show is just me and a tech person so if a venue is trying to get open again this kind of show is is attractive in that way that it's like as least drama off the stage as as you yeah. can bring to a venue you know absolutely absolutely and you're working with uh you're working with joe again Joe Montaigne, he's my director. And yeah, in fact, we're texting now. We're going to rehearse tomorrow. I've been running this all week without him. And tomorrow I'm going to present it to him again. He hasn't seen it in you know, a year. Is this anything like the show we did? Exactly. <laughs> is this anything like what you directed me to do before? I know. He's he's great. I mean, you know, he doesn't uh, he doesn't over direct. But when he has an idea, I, I certainly uh, respect him so much that I, I try, I'll try anything. If he said, you know. You should do that, you know, do a handstand and do that bit. I'll do it, you know? Yeah. Whatever you yeah. want. We'll, uh, well, we'll probably circle back to more stuff about Lenny. The last question I'll ask about that, though, right now is I'm just, do you feel like um, 
having done the show, I mean, do you have do you have a count in your head? How many times have you done the show at this point? Three hundred and thirty. Oh, I was going to say like 150. Wow. I didn't realize you were 330 that. for an audience. I've done it. Wow. Really okay. Now. But for an audience, 330, I did, I guess I did a hundred. And so what's the math here? We did a hundred off Broadway. Exactly. Mm. 85 in Chicago and the rest in LA. So is that like maybe 125 or 120 in LA? So yeah. Something well, like maybe a hundred. 140 something like that yeah maybe whatever the math is yeah yeah 330 performances of this this monologue for an audience of course i've said it more than that in rehearsal and yeah whatever, but yeah I've been and how and how much at this point do you feel like you're still kind of discovering it versus is it sort of just like to some degree anchored in pretty solid as far as your understanding clear of exactly who lenny is and exactly what the arc of the story is versus still kind of feeling like you're in the process of finding it no i'm still in the process because once i feel like i'm on autopilot i guess there's a difference i guess there's the best way to explain it if i feel like i'm on autopilot i'm going to stop doing the show that means i'm checking mm. but it, but if i'm but if i'm wearing the performance like a loose sweater and i'm feeling good about it and like and i and i'm, I'm that's I'm, that's lenny right there on stage oh, yeah. Yeah. if i'm dancing in this direction or that direction within the piece yeah. and discovering and exploring then um i can't wait to get back to that because that's when i was happiest i'm not there now i'm white knuckling this performance right now i'm like oh shit what's next you know yeah uh, although, is that although i'd hazard a guess probably anybody watching it wouldn't necessarily be able to tell but you know no, in but your own skin you're going oh yeah there's a difference when you're wearing it like a loose sweater you know it's like this mm. it's it's like you're exploring and you know i remember before doing this show, I remember like having to do a two minute monologue going, oh, I gotta learn this monologue, oh Jesus. And now it's like a 90 minute monologue. I was like, I don't wanna hear anybody complain about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yep. go open that yep. monologue. And I've done it 330 times. A lot of times people wanna do something two, three times and then they retire it, you know? I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't know it. I don't even, I didn't even know this performance at all until maybe my hundredth performance. That's wow. when I started to go, oh, okay, there's something here, maybe, you know. I remember Al, Al Pacino saying something like that about doing, God, I think it was Richard III or something he was doing on or off Broadway. And uh, I think it must have been Richard III, maybe. And then that he felt like it wasn't until like the 300 something performance that he suddenly came into the scene and in the court with all these people around him. And he suddenly went, oh, and I, I finally get it. I get I've been, it. I've been I've been going through the motions and kind of doing what the director told me to do, but being like I don't understand what the hell this is, and then finally something kind of clicked into focus for me. I had that last night. There was mm. a, I was doing on stage. I was running through the show, and I went, oh, 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 wow, wow, okay. And it was like a moment that I had never saw before. And there's been something pretty nice about getting away from it for a year or two, in a sense. You know, it's like I am coming back at it fresh. Uh, yeah. And it, and it, I don't know, I'm excited. I'm excited to do it again. It takes, it takes everything out of me. I mean, I'm pretty tired. I probably look exhausted. I pretty beat up. I, I ran it last night and, and you've seen the show, right? You, twice. you, you saw yeah. it twice. So you know what this thing, what it demands. And so it's, there's no half no, no small, it's tall order, tall order this piece. Well, you know, it's like even when, even the nights when I go, which is most nights, by the way, I go, I don't want to do this shit. How am I going to do this? Thing? And then when I get on stage, it's like when the audience is looking back and I'm thinking about Lenny and I'm thinking about the fact that I'm, I'm blessed enough to be a vessel for him and to bring his story to a new generation of people. That's when it always kicks in. Even when I feel like, oh, I'm going to phone this one in, you know? Within two minutes, I'm like, no way. I got yeah. them we're here together and here we go. And then when you finally get to those courtroom scenes, which you know, in the third act, it's like, there's no way to fake that stuff. Yeah, it's like the, the jet engine is underneath you at that point. Yeah, yeah. If I'm not like, you know that the show's going really well and I'm giving everything I have. When like, I'm up at 1 a.m. thinking, should I take, should I cut my ear off or what should I do? <laughs> That's when you go, oh, he's got it now. He's got it. Because <laughs> my heart doesn't know that I'm acting, you know. Right. You're, well, you know, uh -huh. the name, you know the name of my acting class is Stop Fucking Acting. Yeah, it's like, like, yeah. So, so with this show, it's like 90 minutes of hardcore therapy, you know. It's like your, your nervous system doesn't know the difference. 
No, it doesn't. And so when it's 1 a.m. and I'm sitting there alone with the lights out, staring at the wall, I go, wow, I'm in it, man. I'm doing it, you know. And I know yeah. it sounds so actory, but it's true. I mean, this show kills me, you know. Absolutely. It's no, it's, 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 it, it sounds kind of, it's one of those semi-cliched actory things for a reason. It's like, you know, when you've been through some kind of process that has you in that place, you're in that place. Yeah, and it's so, you're so blessed when you get to be a vessel to, for storytelling in a real authentic way, not just like, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's funny too, I don't want people to feel like it's a big downer. I mean, the play has a lot of laughs too. It's a really interesting piece. It's, it really takes you on a ride, you know. Yeah, well, and I think the major the major takeaway from the piece is a sense of is a sense of hope and a sense of, you know, well, it's funny. And I mean, I don't I don't want to get into talking about what I'm up to exactly, but a play that I'm we're in rehearsals right now for doing Orpheus Descending. Oh, I love and that. The, I love and then you know, and I think the major takeaway at the end is you know these these characters who are kind of the heroes of the show end up getting killed. But the final takeaway is Carol Couture walking away with the with the jacket and with the and kind of with the 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 boon, the treasure, so to speak. And it's like I feel like this, the audience gets the same thing at the end of Lenny, which is, you know, Lenny Lenny paid the price for moving the needle forward, but the rest of us get to walk away with the treasure that he sort of you know had to. Not yeah. that he was not that he thought of himself as like. A sacrificial lamb exactly but that he sort of was oh. unconsciously the the vessel for moving moving the conversation forward yeah well bill maher said lenny bruce uh he planted the seeds and i got the shade and you right. know and that's and i love that i mean that's like right on but you know lenny was in some ways i feel he was a prophet you know this guy like really did so much and sadly he's still relevant i mean the things we're talking about today our country's in big trouble i mean mm -hmm. yeah big trouble and so the things lenny was fighting for are just uh they're still happening man free speech what can you say what can you not say cancel culture what why are words important uh what do words actually mean is it the meaning of the word or is it the intention behind the word mm. what gives words power it, it's all of that stuff i mean it's just it's it's really relevant it's really 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 relevant and yeah. uh I think that's why so many people have gravitated towards the show. And also, in addition to just, you know, liking the show, they come back 12 times. You saw it twice. So, you yeah. know, there's always something to get out of it. Yeah. Um, did you bring your dad? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, remember. Yeah, you, I, you I came and saw it once, uh, once with, a, with a gang of folks from, from 68, uh, from your, your theater company, Theater 68. A bunch of us came. I think that... That may have been a, like a dress run. I don't remember. I mean, I, there were some, there were definitely people in the audience, but I want to say that might have been almost like a, you know, like an. Uh, it was a one night test the venue run six months before we opened in New York. It was a fundraiser for the Lenny Bruce Memorial Foundation. Yeah, but we yeah. had a huge audience, but it was it was like a one time thing. And it was a fundraiser. And we, and then from that, we went, okay, cool. This show can work here. We came back like six months later and did the show. I was going to say, wow, that was, that was six months before the opening. God, that's, that's wild. Yeah, yeah. It was wow. like a one time. It was a one-off. It was really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. And, but I think the, the thing that amazes me about that is like they, you know, at the, uh, I want to say the, the boiler room, not the boiler room, the cutting room. The cutting room. Um, you know, that they, that they were, taken with it to the degree that you know six months later they're like you know hey we got a spot here for you come on down yeah yeah the cutting room they were great they were very kind to us and uh and the show played beautifully there and uh yeah i miss new york i miss doing the show there you yeah oh yeah and yeah my yeah my dad came and he just you know i he, remember he had nothing but great things to say he was like you know he was really pretty blown away i think yeah um, yeah, yeah uh I have all these things I have in mind for, you know, to talk to you about, but I keep things about Lenny keep coming to mind. Are you, uh, are you doing anything in the vein of rewrites or is there, or is that just like you're just in the chance, you know, you, you've been away from it for however long the dust kind of settles and you come back to it with fresh eyes. And is there anything you find yourself wanting to meddle with in the writing? Well, it's interesting. You mentioned that there's a massive thing that I'm thinking about rewriting and that is uh, the infamous N word bit uh for those who don't know lenny bruce uh did this bit about the n-word uh and it was very famous in the 60s and the 
the point of the bit was one of the most anti-racist things you can say. And what, what Lenny was trying to say at that time was, let's not give this word so much power so then it doesn't make a little black kid cry when somebody calls him the word in school. That's the end of the bit. But the whole bit going into it was uh, he was just trying to take the power out of not just the N-word. He said derogatory statements about every ethnic background uh, in the bit. And the idea was like, let's stop making this so important. Like, why is this a phone? Why is this a water bottle? Like, why we, we give words meaning, not the word itself. Mm. But obviously, uh, things have happened, things have changed since the last time I've done it, you know, in the pandemic and George Floyd. And so, so I'm in a really interesting position because, you know, obviously half of me wants to defend Lenny Bruce and go, I'm taking you back on a historical journey to the sixties when Lenny was the voice of the brown and black people. And, and it was very important for him. He would do that bit in segregated clubs, which was amazing. Uh, and they love Lenny. They loved him. They got it. Everybody got it. So, so there's that, right? Like I've been entrusted with Lenny's words and his voice and to then put tape over his mouth again, like they did, is really hard for me to wrap my head around. The other side of that is I can't possibly be tone deaf to the, to the world we're in right now. That, that, so I, I'm struggling with that decision uh, because I understand both sides perfectly. Yeah. Um, and I know that this, whatever decision I make will be an unpopular decision for the other side of the view. Uh, but, but yeah I, they're, I have, they're... yeah, I have to sleep at night and I have to also feel like I'm doing my part. So I don't know. It's very interesting. That, so that, so that's, that's where I'm at. I've been back and forth on this for a month trying to figure out what to do with that. Well, God, that's so interesting. You bring that up because that was, that was a big sort of, I don't want to say a point of contention exactly, but it was something we were talking about a lot in the early stages of, of starting to mount this production of Orpheus Descending of, you know, the, the N-word gets thrown around a lot in that play. And there were a number of people in the cast who were, who were you know, yeah, kind of expressing a real discomfort with that and feeling like, like you said, that wondering whether we were being tone deaf and, you know, at the moment we seem to be on the side of saying, no, you know, I think, that was part of the point Tennessee Williams wanted to make was, you know, look at the way this word was wielded, look at the damage it inflicted and to sort of shine a light on that. Like I think in the same way, Lenny Bruce wanted to say, look at this, look at what this word is doing to people. Um, yeah. That, you know, the idea that by, by shining a light on it and, and letting it be uncomfortable that you actually, you know, uh, uh, that by but by having the conversation you help the situation rather than you know avoiding it but but yeah i don't know i don't know it's i think i think to some degree we're still in the same place that you seem to be which is feeling a little bit of uncertainty a little bit of yeah unsureness about what the well in the spirit is. in the spirit of uh the word being uncomfortable obviously but to an audience and a white audience as well, just like. Oh, well, that was the other thing I was going to mention is it seemed like for the most part, the people who were most uncomfortable with it were, uh, you know, I hope nobody's going to hate me for saying this. Most of the people who were the most uncomfortable with it were white people. And, and the few, uh, you know, people of color that we have in the cast were sort of like, you know, they, they seemed to at least what they expressed outwardly was no, we're, we're not only are we okay with this, we think, yeah, that was Tennessee's point, and let's roll. And let's that, that, that was my experience, too, with Lenny. I, uh, the, the, the African-American people who came to the show, loved it, got it, understood it. And not to say it didn't make them uncomfortable or whatever, but they, mm. they got the whole point. It's the you know 23-year-old little white millennials who are like, I got a problem with that. And I've actually had, I saw one debate in the lobby of a Lenny show where an African-American girl who was in her late 30s said to a young white kid, you don't need to stick up for me. We got it. Hmm. And I was like, wow, that was interesting. So I watched this debate. One thing I will say is as a, as a white person, uh, it is not my word. I have no business using the word. Right. I don't, I would never personally use the word, not because I didn't understand what Lenny was saying, because I do understand how hurtful it is and how, what a price has been paid with that word. And so I don't even think I should be saying it. So the debate is not whether Ronnie thinks it's a good idea. The debate is like, 
how far do I veer away from historical facts and talk about Lenny Bruce, who was defending it wasn't it wasn't negative at all. Uh, the only thing I'll say is so so what I've decided is it's a little different with Tennessee Williams. You know, I'm the playwright of this play. There's mm. so much controversial stuff in my show anyway. So I'm just trying to come to peace with. Is there enough and can I replace this with something that doesn't compromise the show at all and still executes the same meaning, the point? Mm -hmm. I mean, Lenny, Lenny also did a funny thing about uh, talking about ham and pork on stage. He goes, I know I'll offend some Muslims and Jewish people and some vegetarians, but it's my right <laughs> to talk about ham and pork. It was very funny. Vegetarians. No, no, it's funny. So, <laughs> and, you know, so he goes, and that'll offend some certain group of people. Yeah. So I know it's not the same. I'm not comparing him in the N-word. Sure, but sure, but sure. I'm comparing the sentiment of like, let's stop making a word. And so I would say it's a little different for me than it is for you because you're doing Tennessee Williams, uh, his work. And and uh, that's a published play, hmm. which is different than, you know, I, I am the playwright. Uh, so, sure. so I can talk to myself and see what I think. But it's not an easy decision. If it was, I would have made it a month ago. It would make my life a lot easier to make that decision. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I even have cities in, in the country who don't want to book the show because of it. Wow. Wow. That's... Hmm. They haven't said no. They just went... Hmm. So what are you going to do about that? So they want answers, you know, yeah. no, one said, no one has outwardly said, no, that doesn't mean they didn't say no. And I, I didn't get wind of it behind closed doors. Right. I don't know why somebody doesn't take the show, but it's a thing, you know, and I, and I just have to decide which hill I want to die on as it mm. were. Is there any possibility of there being like, almost like a, like a, I'm like imagining Lenny, like almost in character as Lenny coming out and saying, you know, look, almost like Lenny's ghost saying, look, I, I know what's going on in the world today. I mean, I don't know, like some kind of, or even if it's not well, Lenny, I already do some that. kind of a disclaimer. Yeah, I know you're, you're right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, as soon as I, I said that, I was like, oh yeah, there is this. Whole thing. I do that. I say, you know, I know these words are offensive, more offensive now than they were back then, but I was That's... the defender of all people. And if you listen to the bit, the whole bit, I hope you could dig what I was trying to say. I and then I said, let, yeah. let me take you back to 1962. But you know, people only hear what they want to hear. And I will say one more thing about this. Um, is that the N word specifically, that bit in, in my show has opened up so many beautiful discussions after the show that I know would have never happened as a result of it. Sure. It, has, it has not only has it educated white people on the pain that word has brought, it's also done the reverse. Like there was a young uh, African-American girl who uh, I was talking to after the play and she was mad and. Uh, at, at the show about that, not about Lenny, but that. And I asked her, have you ever considered how you feel about this word? She's like, no. Have you ever given any thought? Have you ever searched yourself to decide what this means to you? Not what everyone wants it to mean to you, what it means to you. And she said, no, I haven't until tonight. I was like, that's amazing. I want you to have that experience. Not again, not up to me, but, but, but all I'm saying is good things have come from that. There have been lots of wonderful discussions um that people that people on in every race has had to have uh and so there's been so much value in it but again would lenny do the bit today i don't think so i don't think he would i don't think he would i think he was a smart guy and i think he understood what was happening he would find another clever way to say it and uh to make that point i mean and uh yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, I don't want to be tone deaf. And uh, yeah, yeah. And, and 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 it's not. It's not a sellout if I think I could still make that point another way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think I think he was. You know, as is the case with a lot of comedians. I think you know he 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 made his bone, bones trying to point out the things that he found strange in in society. But I think you know he was more not to be overly sentimental about it, but I think it's like he had a, he had a really soft heart. And I feel like that's what he led with more than his desire to, you know, provoke. Yeah. He, he was, he was provocative, but I don't feel like it was coming from a place of wanting to provoke. It was a place of wanting to, you know, deepen people's thinking. And so, you know, yes. I think you're probably right. There's a sense of having a sensitivity to, okay, this is not the time to make this point in that way. I've actually made a decision that I'm, I'm going to talk to Kitty Bruce, Lenny's daughter, his only living relative, uh, his only 
you know, his only daughter. Um, I'm going to talk to her about it over the weekend and have a heart to heart with her and see where she's at with it. You know, That's so cool. uh, I think that'll be important to do. So, oh, a lot of Lenny talk here. Sorry God, a lot that. of Lenny talk. No, no, no. It's great. It's Lenny. yeah. I, I, uh, I, I actually intended to sort of start this off. So anybody, you know, listening after the fact would have a, you know, a greater sense of who you are, but I want to just take it back. And so I don't think I actually knew this story previously, but so you were, you were 24 years old living in Jersey. Is that mm-hmm. right? Wanting sort of always having it kind of in your heart and mind that acting was the thing, but you just hadn't made that leap yet. Yeah, and then, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, what happened was is when, when um, yeah, I was 24, I guess, because uh, my mother died. Yeah, yeah, I had just turned 24. My mom had just passed. She was 53. She was a young woman. Her and I had gone. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was a garbage man. I worked at a pizza shop. I had all these jobs. You know, I wasn't I didn't go to college, you know, and so uh, it just wasn't my path. And and I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. But one time my mom and I went to a play. And a local community theater play. And I was so taken by what was going on in the room. I was like, oh, my God, like how did these actors, they're right there in the audience is here and we're having this experience together. I was just, I got it on some level that prior to that, I wouldn't have really understood. It was like a perfect storm. And so when my mom, my mom used to say, go, you should do it, try out. I go, I can't try out. I am, I'm, that's not my thing. I'm, you know, I'm scared, you know? And then when she passed it, when I was 24, I was like, what am I waiting for? You know, I want to try it. I don't want my fear to decide. The, the choices I make. And so, so I called that guy, Pat, Pat Carpenter, rest his soul. He just passed away. He was a cool guy. Um, and he, he did a bunch of community theater plays. And I said, Hey, if you ever hear about a tryout, I didn't even know it was called an audition. <laughs> like, yeah. hear, I'm a sports guy. So I'm like, you ever hear about a tryout? I'd like to try out for the play, you know? And he goes, uh, for like the team. Yeah. And he goes, uh, so he called me back. He goes, there's a, there's a tryout. And I was like, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and so Edison, New Jersey, uh, I auditioned for this play and Bill Cecilberg was the director and he gave me my first yes. And I had no idea what the hell I was doing. I didn't know what stage right was. I used to call, I used to call rehearsal. I used to call it play practice, yeah. like football practice. Right. I'm like I'll see you guys at play practice. And everybody's like, <laughs> ah, you know, nobody corrected me. Everybody's everybody. just patting you on the head. Okay. Right. Yeah, like, all right. Yeah. And, I, and that opening night thing, it sounds corny, but it happened to me. I walked out on stage and it was like 99 people in the house, you know, full house. And I walked on stage, made my entrance, you know, and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, I, <laughs> I found it. I found the thing, you know, I fell in love. And, um, and I knew at that moment that I didn't know what the rest of my life was going to look like, but I knew this was going to be a big part of it. I yeah. knew that I like, because growing up on the streets of Jersey, I was, you know, I was a punk teenager and I didn't know what, so we would all go do really stupid things. And then I'd go home and like write poetry. I, I didn't know that I was like an artist. I didn't know how to define that. I didn't know where to put that or label that, but I knew there was something else different between me and the guys on my corner that I was hanging with. And so then it all came together. And I, and I said, even if I have to work a job eight hours a day, I'm going to make this part of my life. This is, I love this, you know, and that's what happened. And, uh, and that was in uh, the summer of, I guess, no, no, the, I guess the fall, winter fall of 95. And then I actually quit my job because I thought to be an actor was a requirement to be a waiter. I swear to God. So it I got is, a, isn't it? I think it is. Oh, I think so. I got a job at the macaroni grill and uh, I was waiting tables for two years at the macaroni grill and I auditioned in, for Tony. In Jersey, you mean? Jersey, Jersey. Yeah. Which is, is not as insulting to Italian families as the Olive Garden, but it's <laughs> uh, but I uh, I I auditioned for this uh, play called Tony and Tina's Wedding in Philadelphia, and I got the job, and I couldn't believe they were going to give me thirty five dollars a performance to act. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, oh my god, I made it, and so I couldn't believe it. So I was commuting. So I had set my life up in a way where. On Tuesdays and Wednesdays, if I did two doubles at the macaroni grill, and then the money I made on weekends, the $35 a night, I could pay my bills. Like I had it all worked out. I was like, oh my God, I'm only waiting tables Tuesdays and Wednesdays, two doubles. And then I'm an actor for five days. So this was like my mindset. And it was cool. 
Yeah, no, that was like my brain. And so anyway, long story short, I, I ended up booking the national tour of Tony and Tina's in 98. Uh, and I traveled the country and got paid $800 a week to act. I was like, oh my God, $800. Yeah. I'll do it for nothing. Right. right. Uh, and then after that, uh, the rest is kind of history. I've been very blessed. I mean, I haven't, I haven't had a job outside of showbiz since the macaroni grill. No kidding. Wow. The summer of 98 is the last job I had outside of showbiz. So wow. I've, been, I've been very blessed. There have been many times I had 68 cents left, but I but I worked it out, you know? I've always found my way somehow. So you were, I mean, yeah, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna get back to that as well in a minute. So basically you you sort of made the leap to start acting and within what? Within like a a couple of years. Yeah, I'd say uh community theater was the end of 95 and then 96 and 97, I probably did five or six plays uh, in, in locally. And then 98, I got, no, in 97, maybe I got the job for the 30 bucks a show in Philadelphia. I was commuting two hours a night. And then I had this Toyota Tercel, this 85, a stick ship, and I had no floor, it was rusted out. So I was a stick ship, but I could see the earth while I was driving. You had, you had, you had AC coming up from the ground. It was amazing, it was, what a life. And I drove that, that thing around the country, actually, that, that Toyota. Yeah, well, I think uh, I remember you, you telling a story, I wanna say at 68, about, about driving your Tercel to LA. Yeah, 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 it ended up in LA, yeah. Oh my God. Uh, no, it was crazy. What a life, you know, but I've been very blessed. And I just, you know, the thing with me as an artist, I didn't want to best advice I could give to any actor, especially now in the digital world is like, I was so worried to be just an actor. And what I mean by that is like in the breadline waiting for jobs and other people to validate my opportunities. And so that's why I taught myself how to write. I taught myself how to direct. I'm a natural producer. I didn't know that, but I, but I knew that I like to bring people together. I like to create things. I like to organize things. So I'm a natural producer. So all those elements, I was like, I'm going to teach myself all these things because if I don't have work, I'm going to go create work for myself. And you've seen it, you know, you see what I do and I produce a lot and direct a lot and obviously write. And, uh, and so acting is, doesn't have the same kind of stress on me because I want to be in a position where I can provide opportunities to people as opposed to waiting for, the phone to ring, you know, I hope the phone rings, you know, it's too much stress, you know. Uh, well, I got to say, even though you, you were to some degree, yeah, running around a little bit like, you know, chicken with your head cut off on the, on the set of unsuited, because you're, you know, you're, you're acting, you're producing your help, you're, you're coordinating so many things, but to some degree, you, yeah, you look like you're kind of just in your element there where you're, your hands are in a lot of pots and you're, you're interacting with different people on different levels. You're interacting with actors, you're, you know, you're helping get them in the right frame of mind. And you're also, you know, overseeing the bigger picture. And then you're, you know, everything. Well, everything. Thank you, pal. You know, for me, it's weird because like, if you asked me to, like, I tried to be a corporate guy for a minute. I, I was a headhunter for a little while uh, before I got into showbiz. Oh, hold on, hold on. You got to unpack that. What are we talking about? A headhunter, get people jobs, not like mafia headhunter. Okay, I'm, not I'm thinking like, like, what are you out here like? No, yeah, people, I was people, got, people got bounties on them, and you're just yeah. you know, roaming, roaming the streets of Edison, New Jersey. I was whacking people, you know. Right. No, what what I'm saying is, is like I had to do this corporate nine to five thing for like a year, yeah. and if you know me, I can't do that. It's horrible. So it just your converses like, and your t-shirts. I get wacky. Yeah, today I look. I usually wear the black t-shirt, but today I, I dressed up for you, chili pepper. Yeah, yeah. Well, we both got. Uh, <laughs> nice. nice. Uh, but here's what I want to say. The reason I love showbiz, the reason I'm in my element, uh, and when you saw me shoot the pilot or whatever, is because I have all this information in my head. I've got a good deal of experience now, still really open to learning. I learn from everybody. So I have got information. But what I love is all the things I know about writing and directing and producing, they apply every project I'm on but it's a new script, there's new actors, new crew people every six, eight weeks. So that's perfect for me because it's like, I know what I know, I know how to do the corporate job of all the elements, but they're new people, new personalities, new script, new characters, new creation. So to me, it's like the perfect mix of like, whatever business I understand, whatever, whatever information I have or whatever, just ex experience or expertise I may have in some area. 
it feels fresh each time because it is fresh, even though I have that information. So to be like an expert in any of those fields, when you're in showbiz is nice because it's a whole new group of people every eight weeks, whatever that is, you know? Oh. And so that's why, that's why it works for me because it feels new, even though I know what I know. I hope that makes sense. No, I think it makes perfect sense. It's like you're, you're constantly having to filter your skill set and your knowledge through this new set of demands, this new set of circumstances, new people, new everything, new. That's yeah, right. it's a whole new, whole new ball of wax every time, but you're still able to keep practicing yeah. that same set of, you know, yeah. your knowledge base. It suits me, you know, that, that suits me where it feels fresh, you know. And, so, and it's the kind of thing you, you can just, you, you keep getting better at that, you know, in that, in that area. You know? Well, you know what, the, I think the key to getting better is, uh, now that you brought that up, is, is remaining even more teachable. Mm -hmm. Because I know what I know, but like, getting better doesn't mean I know more. Getting better means I'm really part of the solution. Like I'm really in the, I'm on the team. I may have the most experience on any particular team at times, but, but really I'm learning from everybody. I think that's how you get better. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know what I don't know. So I'm, I'm available to learn it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, yeah. And so touching on theater 68 here. So you, so taking us back to, you take the Tercel across the country, got the AC coming up off the highway. You yeah. get into LA, you, again, you kind of, you, you just were able to sort of start working from the get-go and then you book, and then you book what seems to be kind of like a big turning point. You book Deuces Wild and you're up there with, you know, Dylan and James Franco is in it. And who else? Uh, well, I know one of your, one of your guys that you've worked with a bunch of times, Vincent Pastore. Yeah. Vinny Pastore was in it, Stephen Dorff, Brad Renfro, Dre DiMatteo, yeah. uh, Jimmy Franco, Walter Zargetti, Norman Reedus. Uh, uh, Matt Dillon, Every, there was so many, everybody was a celebrity basically, except for me, I got this job. There was yeah. a couple of those, but, but yeah, no, right before that, I had been in a couple of acting classes that weren't going great. Uh, and I only mean that I felt like, you know, acting classes are, uh, they're unique in that when I first got to Hollywood, I thought, okay, there's an ad in the backstage. It says acting class, $400, 200, whatever it was, right? And I went, okay, so if I give you my money, you're gonna teach me how to do this, right? That's what you think, right? That makes sense, it's logical. But what I didn't know is that you have to find your teacher, you have to find your tribe and your people. Like if you took my class or whatever, you might totally get it and speak my language and go, I get it, man, I'm better because of this class. Or you might go, I don't, something's off. I don't, great actor, great teacher, great people. It, it, it's not happening so and i didn't understand that so what happened was the reason theater 68 started was because i was in a few of those classes that on paper looked to be the classes but really one was just like a bad therapy session every week and everybody was there to throw up on each other and beat each other mm -hmm. up the teacher was the worst of everybody and i thought well it's they're saying this is meisner and and uh it costs this much money it must be good you know and so after a series of those, uh, I pulled a group of friends together and wanted, said, listen, we don't have enough money to really pay for class. Why don't we meet on Monday nights? We'll meet in my living room. Let's do scene work. We'll hold each other accountable. We'll do, we'll do improv, we'll scene work, we'll do monologues. Let's just work with each other. And some early members were like Eva Longoria. You know, we've had lots of members come through, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people. And so that's how Theater 68 started. Then I booked Deuces Wild, which was perfect. And, and basically at the exact same time, you know, as that. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's how it all kind of came together. You know? That's amazing. And you, had a, and you had an agent pretty quickly by the time you got to LA or you were already? No, not really. I mean, you know, my career has been a really, I mean, I've had different levels of rep at different times. I've been mm. in the best agencies and I've been at, small agencies that are in some ways better because they really are hungry and they fight. So my career is not, ha, has not been defined by my representation. I, uh, that's why I go back to the point of like, teach yourself everything, do everything. And not sit around by the phone, hoping things are going to come your well, way. You know, agents, agents and managers, generally speaking, get 10%, right? 
So that means they can do 10% of the work. I mean, that's how I see it. Like I got to do, I'm getting 90%. I got to do 90% of the work in the world. That's kind of my mindset. And anytime my agent or manager gives me a little, little taste, then it's, to me, it's a cherry on top, but, but I'm not waiting for the phone to ring. I can't, I can't consider that. I, I'm, yeah. Life's flying by, man. I'm, I don't want to jerk around like that, you know? Yeah. You so know. tell me a little bit about those early years with, with 68. So, I mean, and this also, this, I feel like there's so many things in your, your career and your outlook that make me think of things that are in, uh, in a few of David Mamet's books about, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, articulating a vision for how an actor should, you know, think of their career, how an actor should approach show business and it being, yeah, very much about, well, I'll, I'll maybe touch on this at some point if we have time. I know you probably have to get going before too long. Um, from, you know, the idea of not having a plan B to, you know, not giving yourself over to some teacher that some part of your being is just sort of saying this is something's yeah. off here and sort of, you know, trusting your own instinct and, and also just, you know, making it about, no, let me get the people I know together. We're going to do our own thing. We're going to, we're not going to, you know, wait around for the phone to ring and we're not going to, you know, sit around hoping to get some teacher's approval. We're going to do our own thing. We know, we know what good storytelling is and we're going to do it. Yeah, totally. I mean, I feel that way. You know, the thing with teaching too is like, I, I teach an acting class and yeah. as I mentioned, it's called Stop Fucking Acting. And the mm -hmm. reason I teach this class is, it took me, I'd say realistically, so I've been doing this 20 something years. I'd say I've probably been qualified to teach, to share, forget teach, to share information uh, for a decade, probably. And I've certainly had credits longer than that, that I could find 12 Dutros to take my class and go, oh, this guy's got a credit. But 12, what was that? Dutros, Dutros. Oh. It's, yeah. an Italian, it's an Italian word for Dutero, you know, like I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. A couple just, of, yeah. But, but, but I never sat well with me because I don't want to be that guy. I always thought, cause, cause sometimes you go end up in a class and, and somebody like gets that one job, that one credit. And instead of like working at Ralph's, which is a very, you know, which is an awesome job, they'll rather do that. They'll sell, they'll do a class and get a couple people together and they're given information and it's dangerous because as a teacher, I feel like you're in my artistic care. I do not take that lightly. I do mm. not hold that in. Uh, if you, Trevor, are in my class, that means so much to me. And I'm like, I got to give them everything I have. I'm not saying I, and I always say, look, I, I might not be your teacher or the right voice for you, but I might. And bottom line is, is I'm not right or wrong. I'm just sharing what's worked for me. Mm -hmm. And I don't go, this is how you do it now. This is, you know. It's not like that. It's more like, hey, this is this is what I've been doing and consider this. This is what I'm seeing here. And yeah, it's very directorial in some in a sense, too. Yeah. Uh, I do attract some newer actors, which is always fun for me to like go, ah, I get to like help this person and yeah, find, kind of find, find their, their voice, you know. <laughs> Makes me very happy. But but yeah, so so I've always been a believer in like if you wait to the right moment to figure out how to do it, whatever that is, you're going to be waiting a long time. Mm. Just throw yeah. yourself in and figure it out, you know, see what happens. Yeah. Because it's never going to be ideal or perfect. It's just not. So don't yeah. wait, do it, you know. I love that. Yeah. Um, what were some like really, what was, what were your earliest inspirations for wanting to be an actor? So like, let's even say like even before your twenties or, or whenever that sort of vision started sinking in, I mean, when I was when I was a kid, I saw a scene uh, in one of my favorite movies called *The Pope of Greenwich Village*, and it was a scene between Mickey Rourke and Eric Roberts. And I was like young Mickey Rourke and Eric Roberts, and I was like, "Oh my God, that's amazing! Like, maybe I can do that," you know? Mm. And like, it was incredible. So that was like one of my first inspirations. Uh, *The Pope of Greenwich Village*, one of the great films. You should see yeah. it. You great. It was like before indies were indies. Um, but you I'm, embarrassed, I'm embarrassed to say I have not. I have not seen, that. see that movie. No. I love. I mean, I love both of those guys. How could you not? But. Well, Eric Roberts, man. Uh, you know, at that point, he's, was he's one of our best actors. I mean, yeah. Guy. But so there's that. Um, you know, I I don't know how to explain inspirations, but I could. But I guess, and no one's ever asked that. So this is a really this is the first time I'm saying. I think it was more about. 
a feeling I carried around with me that where I was wasn't who I was. And I don't know how to get to the other thing that I feel like I'm missing. I'm not even sure what it was until I walked through the door uh, at the Edison Valley Playhouse that opening night of that play, the first play. So it was like, I had walked around for most of my life going, there's something missing. I don't know. Uh, I know this is not it for me. I'm not sure what the other thing is. And then I went, oh my God. So, I mean, you know, I'm inspired by everything, you know, yeah. all the time, everything, you know, most conversations I've had in my life, good or bad, have left a print on me. So the, all my work comes from, people ask me all the time, like, how long did, were you in rehearsal for Lenny? I said, since I came out of my mother, what kind of question? Is that? <laughs> like, what kind of question is that? Like, I don't even know what that means. Like, that's how I see this work. I don't see this work as like, well, I, I started on April 1st. And like, like, no, I've been in rehearsal my whole life for all of this. I just, I just happened to sort of stumble upon these words at this time and I kind of yeah. ended up on stage and now this is how, yeah. this is what's yeah. being expressed. I had to pick up the script at some point, but I've been in rehearsal my whole life. Hmm. Because when oh, I, wow, I, I love that. When I discover a moment in rehearsal, chances are it's tied to something else at some other point. And so it's, I've been in rehearsal my whole life, good, bad, and, and, and everything in between, you know? And so uh, that's so interesting. God, I, it's funny. It's like, as you're saying that, I'm thinking the, the more time I've spent doing acting, I feel like the more each project feels a little bit more kind of like that, where it feel like when I first, and the other thing I was going to mention, it's so funny, our, our stories are actually kind of similar. It's like I was, uh, I, you know, I, I did go to college and I was there uh, uh, on, on a basketball scholarship and I was, I was there on my recruiting trip and I was just walking around campus with my mom. And I had always been like a, a obsessive about movies, but, like fanatical about movies and actors. And like, I could talk just incessantly about actors, but had, ne had never even crossed the remotest recesses of my mind that maybe I would try acting on myself at some point. And uh, we were walking through the, this like administrative building on campus and my mom, we're walking through there and my mom points over to the right and says, oh, that's look at this theater, it's such a cute little theater there. And she, she'd done some acting in her day. She like went to, you know, she went and studied theater at, at a few places, University of Iowa, University of Texas. She'd like, you know, she didn't graduate college from anywhere either, but she kind of had been like, you know, bouncing around and she went to LA for a while, tried to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So she always had a real affinity for acting and storytelling. So there we are on campus and she's looking over and going, oh my God, the theater, it's so cute, it's so quaint. Maybe you could do a, a play at some point while you're here. And it was, and it was, I think kind of like what you said, it was like, I, you know, I was looking at my mom, like, 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 sorry, what? Like, I'm yeah. like, do you not know me? I'm your son. I, I play basketball. This is, that is not what I do. And, and even at that point, and then, uh, and then, you know, just about a little over two years later, I was, uh, I was auditioning for a play myself um, at, at school and I was quitting the basketball team and moving into doing theater. Um, mama knows best. Ma mama knows best. That's right. Hmm. Um, well, I'm going to have to wrap up here in a couple minutes, and I'm sure you have things you have to get to, too. Um, let me think here. What, what should I ask you last here? Uh, I guess I just want to ask a little bit about, about, again, kind of about process. So, I mean, you know, you, you, you took some classes here and there that didn't, that never really sat uh -huh. totally right with you. You don't have any, like, formal training. You didn't, what, how would you describe kind of like what your process is at this point? I mean, or maybe maybe what we just talked about kind of negates the whole idea, I'm not sure, but to what degree you feel like anytime you are starting to work on a role or you know that you're gonna have to show up on set in front of the camera someday and you have a script, how this, do you approach that? This may, this may put some acting teachers out of business, uh, maybe even myself. Uh, I believe in a tool belt I don't believe in a method. Hmm. Something that worked for me last week might not work today. I just got to have enough in my bag of tricks that has worked for me. When I was 25, I had no idea what I was doing. I, 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 you know, it, took, it took 20 years of doing this for me to start to go, oh, I, 
Oh, okay. That, that's interesting. I started to get it. So my process is generally not the same twice. Usually the material will dictate how I approach it. Sometimes I start with the externals of how does this guy dress? How does he walk? And he gets up, how does he walk? You know, with, with Lenny, I listened to everything I could listen to. I watched everything I could watch. I read everything I could read. I put on some clothes. I walked around. I found his voice, not an imitation. I found it, what I thought was an interpretation. And then I picked up the words for the play. So that was that time. The next time that might not work. Uh, so I know some people subscribe to, this is how you act, A, B, C, D. As I mentioned with the title of my, my classes, I don't wanna watch acting. So I don't even know what that means. I wish they called it living or being. I don't know why we call it acting. I don't want to watch anyone pretend to do anything. Uh, that, that, that's not interesting to me. You ever spot acting? You don't want to watch that. So I want to live. I want to relate. I want to identify with characters. As an audience member, I want to go on a ride with you. And I want you to take me to somewhere I've, I've either been, want to go, have yet to go, gone, yet to go. Uh, so, uh, so, Every time I pick up material, it kind of shows itself on how I should approach it. So my, when I teach my class, I tell everyone from day one, I don't, there's no ABC way to do this. So in my belief, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you all the information. Here's a couple of foundational things that I think you should know. And it's all basic one-on-one -on -one listening, uh, just things of that nature, like making sure that I harp on certain things that like, keep them because you got to have certain foundation to, to do it. But then at some point you find your own voice, your own way. Like I'm, I'm more interested in like having a new actor in my class, helping them with some of the foundational work that I believe is important. And then at some point watching them work so often that they're telling me what they've done. And I go, Oh, interesting. That's cool. I get it. And so, because it's, if you're doing good work, it's a personal job. Mm. I'm no, you know, I don't want to do cookie cutter work. I don't even know what that means. So it's, it's a personal job. Even if I was to do a silly over the top sitcom, which I think is valuable, I still would get to it with some sort of internal clock that I understand, which is funny to me, which is how do you tell the truth in a funny sitcom, right? You still have to tell the truth. There's still a story going on. You yeah. watch some of these great sitcoms are brilliant and you go, oh, they're having, you're dropping these human beings in imaginary circumstances and asking them to tell the truth. So it's really interesting, you know? Um, so I don't subscribe to one way to do it because the first class I went to in LA, that was one of the biggest problems. Forget the fact that it was like terrible therapy and people were beating each other up all the time, which therapy is good, by the way. This just felt terrible therapy. Yeah. Forget that. If, if, it if it's still, therapy, let's call it therapy. Let's not let's not mix it with trying to be storytelling skills totally, for people. Totally. But but for me, the hardest part was A, B, C, D is not how my personality works. If you do this, 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 and this, this happens. That's not how it works for me. Because I go on autopilot, it gets stale really fast. Yeah. I'm yeah. constantly exploring my process. And mm -hmm. uh, and it's different all the time. And so it goes back to the old saying, like, I bring the kitchen sink into everything I do, even a silly sitcom. Mm. Uh, I've been in rehearsal my whole life. That hasn't changed. <laughs> I, love, I, love know, I, I probably have to learn the words and then do what they ask me to do. But that, so that, that's how I see process for me. But you've, but you've been rehearsing being a person all this time. You know, I've been in a lot of situations in my life and, uh, and they all have value at some point mm -hmm. to regurgitate those situations, you know. Yeah. All right. I, I promise. Last thing I want to ask you, uh, what do you find? Uh, what do you find most challenging as an actor? Like whether it's something specific to your kind of craft as an actor that you feel like is a struggle or, or more like a struggle more in terms of navigating the career aspect of it, whether it's so whether it's more craft or career or just however that question occurs to you. Well, I could address both versions of it on stage slash on film my biggest challenge is fighting my face i'm a very animated expressive person um and so there's been i could i could show you things i've shot 
where you literally see me sitting on my hands because I'm a theater guy first. And so it, I learned how to be on film and TV. Some of my early work on film is, it's embarrassing. <laughs> like, it's like, I can't even watch it, you know? But, but so, so, so sometimes it comes nice and easy. And other times I'm fighting my face and I have to find a way to stop fighting my face. And, uh, and so I hope that makes sense. That's my biggest challenge. Uh, and some days it comes really smooth and other days it's not so smooth. Hopefully the public, an average audience member, hopefully wouldn't know the difference between those two days. You know, it's interesting. Yeah. I spent three years on General Hospital, right? Yeah. And basically how I explained that job was, you know, you get 30 pages the day before, you got to shoot the next day, memorize, you get one take. And so essentially- they are fucking moving. Essentially, it was an on-camera scene study class that the whole country gets to watch mm. with me a month after I shoot it. So that that's like literally, that is, but you know what I learned about myself? The days that I did a scene and I came off and I was high-fiving the producers going, yeah, man, I'm a good actor. Yeah, you see that? See that moment? You see that scene? And then the days that I'm in my parking lot kicking my car going, you suck, you suck. You should open a hot dog truck. What's the matter with you? You should never be. A month later, I couldn't tell you which day it was. Mm -hmm. It looked the same. Yeah, that's amazing. So that, to me, that's a professional, hopefully. is like, you go, okay, I did the job. You know, I maybe didn't sleep well that night or I thought I was suddenly a good actor, whatever that is, but I did the job. You know, the other side of that is in terms of business, the bottom line is, here's the best way I could sum this up. What's scary about this business is you don't know what's around the corner, if anything. And what's beautiful about this business is you don't know what's around the corner. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so that, keep, that gives me hope. That keeps me coming. So that's my biggest challenge and my biz, biggest excitement is exactly that. So I love that. I love that. Yeah, yeah, well, it's so funny what you mentioned about, you know, the, the difference between the two days on set. Again, I feel like so many things you say make me think of David Mamet. He talks in that book, uh, True and False, he talks about, you know, actors who, you know, in a play, say he was directing and it's, you know, the same actor comes off stage one night and feels great about themselves. And the next night they come off and they're, and somebody tells them good performance and they go, no, it wasn't. I was shitty tonight. And he's going, I, I could not tell a lick of difference. Listen. And also just coming back to, like you said, it's like, look, the, the job of the actor is to deliver the story to the audience. If you do that, give yourself a little pat on the back and feel okay about it and walk away. Well, it's not for you. It's for them. You know, yeah, yeah. that's why, that's why you have to like, you know, some nights I do Lenny, and, right? and they're not in your head and they're not, they're not worried about your process. They're worried about whether or not the story is clear. Some nights I do Lenny and I'm on fire and I'm just giving them my best and I'm moment to moment for 90 minutes and I'm rocking it. And they're like, and I'm like, what do I have to do for you people? <laughs> then there's nights, then there's nights I'm on stage and I'm thinking of my laundry. I gotta get the fuck home. I'm so busy. I'm overwhelmed. I'm watching myself watch the performance. You know, it's like, shut up, stop it. You know, I'm yelling at myself for 90 minutes and then I get a standing ovation. Mm -hmm. And I go, no, no, last night I deserved one. Not tonight. This is what I want right. to say to them. And I, and so, it's really crazy. It's not my business. It's not it, on, on a day when I understand some days I get this and other days I don't because I care, but, but it's none of my business how they take it. Mm. It's none of my business. Mm. It's none of my business. And I don't always know that. Trust me. I throw, I throw many, many, many temper tantrums all the time. What do you mean? What do I got to do? I, I gave you everything. My soul. Look, my, do you see my heart on the stage? Yeah. Yeah. None of my business. They're, they're going to do whatever they want. They're going to have their reaction. Because they're having their experience. And, and who no. am I to decide what that is? Like, all I could do is present what I present. It's none of my business, you know? Theater has, theater has the power to move people and it has the power to change people. I've seen it. Um, I've seen hearts and minds be changed in a theater in a two-hour period, 90-minute period. So, you know, we're lucky we get to do this. I, I actually say sometimes in my class, I'm like, 
can you believe we get to dress up and act like other people? Like, this is no different than what I was doing in my backyard with my brother playing army and cops and robbers. There's no, this is no different. I'm just a grown ass man now. And people give me money for this. It's crazy, you know? So it's like, when I see it from that perspective, then, then the fun stays in it. Because when you take out the fun, that's when you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. that's when this becomes a whole other thing that's uh can eat you up and swallow you up and spit you out you know yeah i need i need to i need to staple that to my mirror or something that's mm. uh, you're, you're a talented guy you're gonna do great you know i'm a big supporter of yours and, I, that's and, really that's nice of you i appreciate you yeah appreciate you yeah if if you don't if you don't give up on this you're gonna do good things well i think i i was thinking about kind of what you said the other day though is also just how you know if you're not if you're not uh consistently able to find the fun in it then you know you're not gonna you're not gonna make it very far down the road either it's like if you're i was having that experience with like a, something i was putting on tape the other day for an audition and i was just in the middle of it i was going dude if you're if you're gonna drive yourself this crazy over every audition you're gonna you're gonna want to quit in three months you know what I mean? Because if you don't, and do it's like I feel like I go back and forth. Like I'll have periods where I just feel very freewheeling, and an audition comes in, and I call up my buddy. I was like, hey, you know, let's get on Zoom, and I and I do three takes, and I'm like, all right, I'll pick one, and I'm good to go. And then other days where I, you know, I do, I mean, just countless takes of the same scene, and then I come back to it the next day, and I'm like, I'm still not right, and I'm, you know, beating my head against the wall, and I just go, dude, th this is not sustainable. You know? No, that it's kind of true. It, it's true. I am hell. Yeah. Sorry, this is uh, this is actually my publicist. You're good. Uh, you're good. Well, dude, we can we can wrap up, man. Um, look, I can set you free here. Look, you 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 you're doing a great job, pal. I'm very proud of you, and uh, you just keep going. You know, that's the thing. And here's the thing. I I guess I want to end with this. If if any artist ever feels that they don't want to do it anymore, for the right reasons. It's okay. Like, it's not movie star or bust. I, I know artists, true artists, who I adore and think they're wonderful artists, who like work an eight hour a day job and they make sure they do three plays a year and they make sure they do the thing. And, the, and so it's not all or nothing. We all want to make a lot of money. We all want to uh, have our foch on the, uh, on, on the billboard, you know? But you can't define it that way if those things come that's great that's just that's just a, a you know a culmination of the success you're having but i know a lot of really kick-ass artists who aren't getting those opportunities but are really artistically fulfilled because they've come to peace with the understanding of that and so like i just want to say that out loud you know if you ever want to go home it's okay to go home mm. you know what i mean we put the we put it on ourselves we put this like these chains on our shoulders and it's well, like, yeah, it makes me think like, yeah, as an artist, like clearly you have, you have the impulse and you have the ambition to want to share what you have to offer as an artist with a, with as big of an audience as possible. But I also get the sense that, you know, you could, you could be, you could be okay going back to Jersey and doing community theater and just, you know, having your life. That's true, pal. And it came to me over the last few years, actually, the pandemic had a lot to do with that to be, if I'm being honest, I realized uh, sometimes I chase things, uh, the wrong things down the wrong path. And, and that in turn, I give a little less energy to the people who deserve my energy. Mm. So uh, it's very interesting, it's very interesting. But I had to come to that. You asked me that 10 years ago, I would have said, no way. Right. The play is the thing, I gotta do the thing. Yeah. And now I'm like, there's room for all of it. And, it, and you know, anyway, all right, look, what can I tell you? Thank you, man. Thanks for one. Uh, th thank you for thank you for the time, dude. I really appreciate this. This is fantastic. Good, good. I can't fantastic. wait to. Uh, well, let's keep in touch, and we'll do a million things together. So don't worry about that. That we will, dude. Oh. All right, love you, buddy. I love um, you, pal. Be good. Be good. All right. Have a beautiful. Break, break a leg on these first few performances back. I'm gonna do my best, man. I hope yeah. you get to see it. Where, where part of the country are you in right now? I'm uh, I'm in Colorado still for the next probably a couple of months i'm tying up some loose ends here and then uh, i'm going to be back in hopefully back in new york by like early november okay pal. Uh, that's good to know all right keep in touch you're the best i love you
Keep going. Cool, man. Talk soon. All right, brother. Thanks, Ryan.